Yeah, it's great, it's great to have both of you back uh, on for a talk. I think last time we uh, convened together, we were talking about Frank's contributions to the Basis Center. Um, but this time, let's just jump right into this, because I'd like to gauge both of your thoughts on the recent UAP task force report. Uh, you know, this report's been greatly anticipated by the UFO community and you know, it was given a fair amount of mainstream media coverage, some of which was, of course, overinflating the kind of information we should expect. But I think the majority of people in the UFO community, at least, were, were bracing themselves for a not so revelatory report. And, uh, you know, I couldn't think of two better people to go over this with the possible implications, where it might lead, why it was structured the way it was structured. And uh, so, Frank, let's start with you, mate, because you did say to me that you have the inside track on a few points that nobody's covered. So what are your overall thoughts regarding the UAPTF reports? OK, sure. Um, I'll start off with a quick shout out to PsychoOp on Twitter because he actually made a, like a really, really brilliant comment, which is basically um, I was happy with the report, but I get a lot of people weren't. But I didn't set myself up for high expectations. Right. PsychoOp, he actually said if you're feeling underwhelmed right, with with the ODNI's UAP report, then have a look at like, you know, the conclusions of Blue Book, um, the uh, Condon Committee and the Robertson panel. Yeah. And you read back through those and then you read the you come back to the ODNI's report. Mm. Um, and actually, it is quite revelatory if you didn't set up, set yourself up for fail. If you're expecting a complete disclosure about everything the US government knows about, you know, UAP, and we know that they know more than they're letting on then you would be in for a big disappointment. Um, I, I said in my first paper, you know, that they, they weren't going to say anything that would compromise, uh, you know, sources and methods, yeah. uh, platforms, capabilities, nothing that is going to help, um, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, North Korea, you know, or anybody else who's causing problems like Iran. Iran. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, I really, you know, I really wasn't expecting if they're going to open up like, you know, Wright Patterson in the basement or they're, you know, going to open up yeah. hangars at like yeah. Area 51. But uh, I think actually what we got out of it overall is uh, is pretty impressive. And I actually got a, I mean, we can go through it in more detail, but just as an overall, um, there was quite an interesting point, which was just finding it now. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Mellon. This is actually one of the best pieces that I saw on it, but it would be come from him. But he goes, um, it, the report, has val validated the UAP threat, forced myriad stovepiped agencies to share information and has garnered the attention of policymakers and the public. Right. OK, so that's a win. Furthermore, it did all of this without a penny of appropriation funding. OK, right. So that's the positive aspects. We can go through the, the negative aspects. If we were going to the, you know, the, the big ones for me were, you know, kind of they didn't mention the, the nuclear aspect, the nuclear threat aspect, right, right. which is a very big one. But we can discuss in more detail. Yeah, so um, it and it's really clear that this report was principally limited to events from 2000 forward onward. Mm -hmm. So none of the major things all of us know about as deep conspiracies, et cetera, they didn't cover any of it. And they mostly limited themselves for the public parts of the report to those times that you know about all these Navy reports. And, and, and the other thing that's clear is that there that if there's anything from the Air Force or the Army, it's not listed, uh, though it may be included in the hundred and something that were not uh, listed. OK, so but that's not the most important thing that happened that day. The most important thing that happened that day was. One level down from Lloyd Austin, one on the same corridor as Lloyd Austin. In the office, sitting right next to Lloyd Austin, is the Deputy Secretary of Defense. The Deputy Secretary of Defense issued an order to the entire Department of Defense and right. its attendant agencies, telling them they were going to work harder for this UAPTF stuff, and they needed to come together and tell us how to do those things that will answer the spirit and letter of the of the what it is the armed services committees and the senate and the intelligence committees in both the house and senate want from this that's number one and number two four or five days later uh even though avril haynes sent the report over to the the committees uh, she reported out through the her public affairs office in the Directorate of National Intelligence that there would be a follow-up, much more highly detailed, fully sourced 
version of this report in 90 days from the day that report came out. So now we have a new clock ticking yeah. and we have this order from the deputy secretary of defense. And th that's, that's number one. And then, uh, neither Austin in defense or Avril Haines in intelligence or the president of the United States through his national security advisor have stopped any of this. It's clear they're letting the ball roll further right, and right. faster downhill. Where that will go, I don't know. But what I do know is people are shocked by what they're finally seeing. Yeah, I, I, I find that really interesting because, I mean, Kathleen Hicks, I followed her for years like when she was at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is a you know a very a highly prestigious strategic a global strategic studies think tank, which is based in the U.S. But uh, so she, when she came on board, generally, I was really, really looking forward to it. So I thought, you know, she knows about strategic studies. She knows about the China threat. She knows about international relations. She's an academic at the top of her game, you know. Um, and what I found fascinating about her letter was, you know, it says the report conf also confirmed that the scope of UAP activity expands significantly, significantly beyond the purview of the Secretary of the Navy, right. i.e., i.e., it's much oh, yeah. more, much more than he can handle, right? Who, ha who heads the, the UAPTF. And then she goes, I direct the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, blah, 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 to, uh, to develop a plan to formalize the mission. So it's not going to be a task anymore. It is yeah. now going to be you know, okay. a so, so, formalized so, uh, structure. I want to even, I want to emphasize even further what this means. Frank has gotten the, the really good point, but let me explain to you what that means. Okay, so the way the intelligence community and the DOD sensor systems are structured. All of them work inside of silos. Okay, so the Air Force will own one and an office in the Navy will own one and an office at this place will own one and the National Reconnaissance will build and operate a bunch of them, but they don't own any of the output. The output goes to other agencies and those agencies defense department agencies own all these outputs and they write the reports because that's their job is to write those reports. What this has done is this, uh -uh. so you remember the gripe that Chris Mellon wrote on the to the, Car to the Stars Academy website complaining about all these sensors we have and we can't use them to do what we need to do. And so what this says is the thing that I was pointing out when Chris first brought this blog out is all of these sensors have massive capabilities, but they are stovepiped and, and no one shares the data. So if you want to fuse all these systems together to make a single product, you need the kind of office and the kind of structure that the now the under the deputy secretary of defense has ordered an under secretary of defense to put together across all departments and all mil, all department of defense agencies including all of these sensors now what's what's wrong with the current sensor structure outside of they don't share data with each other in any meaningful way is let's have a missile detection system let's consider one uh, we're not going to talk about any details. We're just going to say, let's consider one. They, they, so those, those things are really unbelievably sensitive. We're not going to talk about how they work. We're just going to call them super sensitive. And so they get a lot of false alarms uh, that, they, that are things they don't really want. So if they want to see Russians or Chinas uh, or Iran or North Korea launch missiles, they, they tune these systems in such a way that it filters out all the clutter except for those missiles so that when they get an alarm, they really pay attention to it. Okay, but inside that clutter are the unusual things that might be a UAP. So they've got to go back under one umbrella, glue these sensors together, but also give the, 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 the attendant uh, office that's put together for this the authority and the budget to expand these matched filters so they can find other things like go fast or fast walkers or whatever they call them coming in from outside of Earth's orbit into the atmosphere. Once they're in the atmosphere, look at all sorts of other systems and glue all these systems together so we can have one data stream that's fused over one event uh, from all these amazing sensors. Anything to add there, Frank? 
No, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, if you want to see more about that, have a look at my first paper because um, yeah. Bob's in at least uh, three or four paragraphs on that talking about the sensor fusion, using right, right. using algorithms. Um, he actually got a very interesting, um, actually a quick quote. He goes, uh, "Let's this is for Bob, right? Let's suppose a large spacecraft enters our atmosphere and is detected by some camera. Well, let's suppose it is moving at high speed and giving off electromagnetics. It's tearing up the atmosphere and we have all these sensors all over the world listening. Until we fuse all these things together, we don't know how to make them work collaboratory, collaboratively. Um, and then he talks about, yeah, all bodies emit black, black body radiation. Um, and it means, uh, yeah, basically they can be tracked. And, I think, and, yes, and one, and one more, shift let's, suppose, let's suppose they enter the ocean after they come in from outside of the Earth's atmosphere and go through the atmosphere. No one is listening to the underwater detection microphones and saying, OK, that thing saw it coming. This thing saw it slowing down. This thing saw it enter the water. Nobody's gluing all that together. That looks like now it was on board now, though, right? It does look it's like it looks to me like it's it's going to happen now. But I'm going to tell you, that is a massive program that will not come together overnight. Can I, can I say one thing on the NOAA front? Yeah, go, right? go ahead, uh, Mike. Go ahead. That's actually pretty sneaky as well. It's like NOAA, you know, people are, okay, associate with the states. But actually, it has collaborative projects, right, with other entities like the Europeans. Um, I visited, um, what was it, two years ago in uh, Las Palmas de Gran Canaria, right? There's a like an, an onshore and an offshore facility, which is which is run by a Spanish organization, which is part of an EU uh, oceanographic um, operation. And they basically have sensor boys that they run for NOAA. And some of these things are adept. Some of these things are like a thousand, a thousand feet or more in the ocean, right? Plus, they've got all kinds of, uh, of drones that literally just kind of crawl along uh, subsurface and, and they sort of go up and down in depth at about sort of, you know, four to five knots. And they literally just spend months just, just traveling around. So they've got all these sensors, even outside of NOAA as well, that they're hooked into. And these and sensors come up and they download their data through a satellite or whatever, and then they go back down and do their job again. And uh, so, so you, you want them to go above and below uh, layers that are changing in salinity or massive changes in temperature, because what happens if, something is below one of these layers its signal comes up and bounces back down you want here so you need to move up and down that's the reason frank's talking about this moving up and down because right, right. we want different layers of salinity and different layers of temperature so you kind of hear everything in the layers something i uh something i want to ask you both because you know it seems to me well it's pretty obvious that they're trying to kind of section the discussion of UFOs off, uh, as you were saying, with the scope of the UAPTF being from 2004 onwards. Uh, you know, I just can't imagine that history not rushing up to meet them inevitably. It, feel, it feels like at some point there's no way this is going to be able to remain a modern conversation because... Just, that's not, that you're, you're, I'm just going to tell you, just let me say as strongly as I can, that is really a naive approach. And I'm going to explain to you why. Okay, so let's suppose a bunch of people, 25 people, were put in a, a deep, dark program back in 1947, and they worked on things for, let's say, a decade, and they all left that work in 1957 and signed away their life as never talking about it again, and whatever they did went into a bin deep down in a silo, and then the program expires, and it's gone, and all of them die, whatever they did, is in some box someplace and they're dead and gone and not gonna, not available to talk about it. I'm just telling you the way this stuff has been compartmented and sealed off, the longer we go, the more people that actually know will die and we will lose that information. Right, right. But I mean, is is there not is there not potentially uh, you know the idea that these legacy programs are being continued that they're not just dying off with their you know predecessors but they're they're still being continued to some degree, right? If I, they exist. I, 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 I got to tell you, I, I have seen per examples where you, you get the least little bit of, of an old program because they don't want you to make the same mistakes they made, or mm. if they, mm. or they might mention a mistake and let you go on, but they kind of want you to start over in some cases. And they share right. very little data from one to the other because that violates the compartmental boundaries they put around yeah. it in the beginning. Yeah. I, I'm going to tell you, I think it's going to be really difficult to reconstruct all that went on from 1947 oh, to 19 to 1970. Absolutely. No, my, my only point really, I guess, is that 
so much of this very what people would consider to be outrageous kind of conspiratorial stuff of oh there's you know craft in the desert being reverse engineered area 51 all that has been relegated to a corner of society that was not taken seriously and what we're seeing is a, is a flip of that so you've got congressmen and senators you know being briefed and it just makes me wonder if you know what they are getting access to now might spark that realization within people who are decision makers lawmakers people who can put pressure on the government will some of them be sitting there going wow maybe that stuff is real maybe there is maybe we should look into the idea call me crazy guys but maybe there are actually programs within our structure should we look into that and it just i i don't expect the government to even make some level of attempt to be transparent about that but i just feel like the way we're going with this it might precipitate that level of action from congress or the senate i don't know maybe i'm being naive <laughs> i was gonna say one point i mean we know uh if you look at the, the longer term background events and context surrounding this report because you can't just look at the report yeah. you look at you know the, the context around it um if you read between the lines it looks like okay very much like the air force doesn't really want to play ball and they say there's right. no standardized reporting mechanism except the, the navy established one in march 2019 right and they said the air force sub subsequently adopted that mechanism in 2020 but we know we know from <laughs> from the black bolts FOIA research yeah that they had um uh, that there was a reporting document the air force had that goes back at least to 2000 so we yeah. know they're talking crap when they said that there wasn't a, a reporting mechanism for the airport before so why is the airport not? Uh, why is the Air Force not, um, you know, playing ball? Is it sort of an embarrassment over, um, you know, Blue Book? Is it? I know, would lingering? assume it's historical embarrassment. I would assume it's historical embarrassment. I don't know. Maybe you know, what what would you say, Bob? I, I, I. So let us suppose that all the popular conspiracy theories that we've ever heard about 1940 to 1950 are true. Let's just suppose. That means that lots of crimes, lots yeah. of civil action, civilly, civil actions could be brought and so forth. And it would be just a disaster yeah. if yeah. like all these people were outed and all these stories came forward. I just don't believe it'll ever happen. If they because started digging up the bodies, do you mean? Yeah, I don't believe I don't believe we're ever gonna see any of that stuff admitted to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I not, in, not in the open. I don't think it would, it would ever no, be no, in the open. It would, have to unless, be, it would have to be in camera. Because unless it, as some well, sort I mean, of legal mechanism was set up to protect people that were in programs to come out and speak about it, you know, in, unless they were, you know, promised not to be tried under the, uh, you know, the Patriot Act or whatever, and uh, and were given some level of immunity. I, I think well, that's the only one, way. That one thing I am certain about, I am absolutely, look, we're sitting here talking about the United States government. Of course, there's the, there's the, four, there's the fifth estate. There is nobody right. going to stop right. the right, the right bird dogging uh, investigative reporter on a, the a military and intelligence uh, gathering reporter from digging and digging and digging to try to find a crack. And I think that's the one way we have real hope of finding out anything. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. The other interesting one is the Department of Energy, because they don't actually appear right. in the report either. No. Um, but yet in in the first base paper I did, um, there's Eric Davis talking to, to Jack's Dr. Jack Starfatti, right? And Eric, so this is an indicator. I can't I'm, I can't believe nobody picked up on this. So it says I have no UFO propulsion physics. This is Eric Davis. No UFO propulsion physics projects to be funded because my new employers don't don't fund that type of research topic. Uh, I know a few U.S. government personnel already know who you are and what you're about, but exotic. UFO propulsion physics research is not in their portfolio, okay? Actual research falls under the purview of the military service labs and the DOE labs. Your yeah. UFO propulsion idea will have to stand up to scrutiny by the defense science, military service labs, and, DO, and DOE labs review boards and panels. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, the yep. DOE. And, and, then, and then the DOE is missing from this report as right. being a contributor. And I'll, look, I mean, and we some of the most some of the most unreal uh, mm. phenomenon related events that we know about happened over Sandia National Labs and Los right. Alamos National Labs, and they aren't, they aren't discussed anywhere. And we know about those uh, things uh, happening, including uh, reports of things going in and out of bunkers, et cetera. I mean, just if any of that stuff is true, it ought to be covered in this because I mean, that. And, 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 and the Bentwater is the same kind of deal. 
an orb went inside one of these bunkers that was full of nuclear weapons. And if this stuff isn't covered and right. brought forth, uh, they aren't really doing the job that I think was ordered. Right. No, that need that needs to be a part of the conversation. Is the uh, is the infatuation with nuclear capabilities? I mean, that is probably one of the the biggest red flags for any sort of uh, you know government or, or or any citizens because you know that's a that's an extremely palpable connection that exists within the UFO history and it goes well, that back. Is, that is that's the one thing that you can point to right. which until oh, we know their intention is has to be considered a threat by any defense establishment in the world. That's the only option they have. That's yeah. their only job is yeah. to look at things and see whether or not it's a threat. These things went in and around nuclear facilities. If the Department of Defense and the intelligence community and the Department of Energy and the NNSA in the United States and their equivalents around the world aren't looking at why these things are interested in our nuclear facilities as a threat, they are not worth the taxpayer dollars we're giving them. Yeah. That might be that, go on. Go sorry, on, sorry, go on. I was gonna say don't forget um that letter, uh, that fascinating letter from Hal Putoff to the Supreme Court of India. And he's basically saying, you know, you guys need to, you Pakistan and India, you guys yeah, need to be yeah. talking to each other so that you don't end up having like an accident. Uh, and you know, yeah. nuclear exchange yeah. through misidentifying uh, UFOs. There was a few um, of them. Lou Elizondo contributed to that as well. He wrote yeah. a letter. Uh, there was a few people who, who wrote who wrote a letter in that regard. And um, yeah, that was, about, that, was, that, that was the first incident that I ever ever began to pay attention to Danny Silva, who <laughs> exploded it on the world. And if yeah. you'll notice that page on Silva's report down at the bottom, Tom DeLong comments on. It. Uh, he did. Yeah, I know. I noticed <laughs> that. Actually, that yeah, you, you've just sparked a memory. I, that that was before I really knew who Danny Silva was, and I remember going like, oh, well, wow, I didn't oh, know who he Tom was DeLong, at all until then. Commented, like, yeah, it was yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and then um, Davis in that uh, interview with Alejandro Rojas, I put my yes. first paper. Oh my gosh! He, yeah, he, he was talking he about, about the. Um, yeah, he was talking about the um, you know the the northern tier silos being shut down in the 60s and the 70s, and he goes, which is dangerous. Yeah. The Soviet Union had decided to launch a war uh, there and then. The damn UFOs would have rendered it impossible for impossible for us to do a counter strike right. because our right. goddamn ICBMs up in the northern <laughs> tier were shut down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is probably a good little uh, discussion point to go on. I mean, we, we know from documentation that this issue with nuclear capabilities has been going on since the Cold War era. Um, the, the fact that the fact that there hasn't been any sort of nuclear fallout either caused by the phenomenon or by humanity, I kind of have this idea and it is just, uh, you know, an intuitive idea. There's no no evidence behind it other than. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, there seems to be a controlling mechanism going on. But I just get the feeling that there, there may be an overarching nuclear mitigation, you know, operation that is not human, that is not it's not it's not in our control to let loose all of these nuclear payloads on this planet. There is something that we don't fully understand that has the ability to come down and quite literally stop our process from happening. Would Would, he, would you guys agree with that or do you have a different idea about the nuclear connection? I, no. I, I I just don't have any idea what the nuclear connection is about, which is one of the reasons I'm so happy we're now actually going to be forced to look at this and All use right. our collection of sensors to look. So, look, let me, let me point out some things. The Russians and the Chinese and the United States and our allies and friends, we 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 incur on each other's territories, look into each other's reactions all the time and we back away uh just short of getting into an engagement all the time that's how we learn how each other will respond that's how we learn how each other's systems work that is exactly what these craft are doing they are encroaching seeing how we'll re we will react and understanding our systems. And to me, the single most shocking things that were told to us about 2004 are that the fancy radars that were on the Super 18, on the F-18 Super Hornets, these are not just regular old dummy send out a pulse radar and hope you get one back. These are really, really fancy radars and they do 
all sorts of things to mitigate somebody being able to jam them. These are these are really, really, really hard, super secret yeah. radars that have anti-jamming capabilities. And the thing jammed them till their radar scopes saw streaks all across them. How yeah. do I know? I heard an interview where they admitted that happened. That means whatever this is, is inside an understanding loop of our systems that understands how they mitigate against jamming and overcame it to successfully jam us. That's number one. Number two, when the when the uh, uh, the, the the mission, if you will, that Kevin Day and others talked the fleet into sending Fravor and Dietz to do was over, they said, okay, boom, scramble, here's your cap point, go yeah. there and come yeah. on home, right? And before they could turn their airplanes, they were called back on the radio and says, you're not going to believe this. That tic tacs over your cap point. That means they, they are listening to encrypted communications. Those things are things that are done by, by, by all sorts of earthbound systems and people that are preparing for an action. So if, if the military and the intelligence people around the world that see this stuff don't have to don't aren't saying to the cell to themselves why do they have the ability to do this if they're only here acting peacefully when they keep poking us in the face showing us they're there there the only assumption you can make if you're in the military or in intelligence is we have to consider this to be a threat until they announce their intentions yeah, I agree with that completely. I mean, go back four and a half decades, right, to 1976, like north of Tehran. Um, oh, you know, Major yes. then Jafari, he's in an F-4, he's in a, you know, and uh, he's a second uh, aircraft that tries to intercept the UFO, and he tries to select a missile because an orb comes, well, something detaches from the UFO and comes flying at him. He thinks it's some kind of projectile weapon, and his weapons panel goes dead. So they, you know, they jammed his weapons panel, but he was still able to fly. His avionics still working. Uh, mm. But he lost communications as well. He couldn't communicate back with his base and his intercom went dead. So he had to shout at his backseater and they were both absolutely terrified. So and that's a very, you know, that's an incredible capability that they can, you know, because normally you'd think, OK, you, you have like, you know, heavy jamming or you'd fry the electronics right, or there'd right. be an EMP, something like that. But they can selectively target different parts well, of that's, the aircraft. That's, that's an important point because, uh, you know, um, I mean, that's a defensive tactic. That's not an offensive tactic. You know, that's that's defense. And it, obviously, the, you know, this this uh, fighter was looking to load up his missiles and, and, you know, fire at this thing. And it it prevented that without causing any sort of undue harm to the pilot. So, you know, that I mean, I'm always looking to be the optimist and kind of bring it back to the idea that perhaps it's not a, you know, a, a terrifying alien threat that we're dealing with. And perhaps it's something a little deeper and there's a, you know, a little bit more of a connection. Okay, so so l l let me give you let me just just. just Slightly alternative view again, Go for using it. the same cir circumstances. Remember, we, the Russians, the Chinese, et cetera, have poked each other in the eye for decades. And each of us has tens of thousands of nuclear warheads ready to shoot. But we've never had a war. Does that mean we're all peaceful and loving each other? <laughs> no, it no. just means we are continuing to poke to try to find a weakness. And once all of the weaknesses are found, if, 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 if we prepare, for every eventuality in case there's so all I'm telling you is the 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 people who are running the Department of Defense and the intelligence community are, have literally no choice except to say this looks like reconnaissance yeah. and trying yeah. to find out how our electronic systems work so that we can be defeated. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. This is the only way in which they'd be able to handle this scenario anyway when dealing with something that they have to classify as an unknown. I think my my issue is that I believe that there is at least some aspect, and it's definitely not the surface level of government, but some aspect of uh, of the government or the private sector has a better idea of what this is. And uh, and I guess well, then they're doing why. a disservice to the taxpayers because we're well, spending exactly. a, tri a trillion dollars exactly. on defense stuff that maybe is not needed. OK, but that just means they have a responsibility to tell us what they know. Yes. I was going to say, guys, ask yourself another question, right? And using the Tehran case, OK, uh, Tehran is a little a little forgotten uh, hotspot in, in, in the Cold War. 
Yeah, you don't forget before the revolution, the Shah of Iran was the major client of the United States. I mean, they had F-14 Tomcat, the most advanced air-to-air -air intercept in the world at that time. Even the Israelis didn't have them, right? And that whole border with Russia was massively contested. And the Americans supported the Iranians. Why? Because they didn't want communism in the country. But most importantly, because they didn't want the Russians in World War III steaming through Iran and going all the way, motoring all the way down into the Gulf states, right? And the thing, that, let me go one, one or two decades earlier. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we, were not, we were not saints in dealing with Iran. But what was happening before we install the Shah of Iran is Russia was making a deal to come into uh, Iran and get a warm water port and get access to all their oil. And back then, petrodollars and oil was everything. I mean, we we hope yeah. that's over now. But I'm telling you, back then, there was it was like we were we considered ourselves in a fight for our lives against the Soviet Union who was about to move into Iran and make a deal and get a warm water port on the Persian Gulf and get access to all that oil, and we ended it. The, po the point I was going to make uh, from the point of view of the intelligences right behind the UFOs is yeah. that that region was heavily, heavily contested. You had the, the, the Americans uh, mounting reconnaissance missions from Iran uh, all along the border, sometimes into oh, Russia. Yeah. The Russians well, trying in. to do the same thing. Yeah. You had air-to-air -air radars, um, uh, you know, anti-air radars going on the whole time, a massive amount of communications uh, and radio frequency, right? A lot of radiation. So if you were a high, uh, if you were uh, a superior intelligence, you would know with all your monitoring capabilities that this is a highly contested area between right. warring human tribes with a lot of military equipment, right? In, 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 a, in a relatively you can small learn a area. Lot. You can why, learn would, a why would you stick? Why would you stick? Yeah, but why would you stick yourself in there unless you wanted to like know more? Right. Right. Exactly. But, but that might not be t that might not necessarily be. All right. Let's analyze their, you know, their capabilities strategically, because one day we're going to we're going to take them over. Like, you know, it, it, it could be any any sort of I guess I, and I'm guilty of this as well. Like, uh, but it's the idea of applying human methodologies, human ideas and, and uh, tactics to something that could be so so outside of our normal you know thinking process no i agree but you you know as a as a you know as a military intelligence professional professional you can't afford to think that yeah. you know the other guy is going to have good intentions you've got to assume the worst case scenario what's going to happen if he does this right so because, i have to be prepared you're, for because that. you've got a you have to war game out your response if what yeah. what is being announced to you is right. preparation for a bad activity no, of course. Yeah, if, every, if everything goes great That's and nothing job. happens, then fantastic. Uh, the, you know? the, the, reason, the reason I'm being so emphatic is uh, I agree that to, for the most part, we haven't seen any hostility from these things. We've seen a lot of interest, a lot of curiosity, but we haven't seen any hostility except for some cases for which I think some evidence should be brought forward and, and shown to us if there have been actual hostilities right, right. where people have been killed or hurt. Okay, so – but what I'm telling you is I'm trying to play devil's advocate yeah. and show you that that's the military and the intelligence community's job is to understand potential threats and prepare to answer them. Yeah. Okay. If we're going to deep, go deeper into threat, right? I talked to those section on allies in my first paper. I said, you know, why aren't they talking to their allies? If you go to 1977, 78 in Brazil and, er and the Kolaris case, and Eric Davis talks about this. And he says, and then there's uh, Colaris Brazil, where the box-shaped UFOs were actually killing people and injuring large numbers of people, and they were using beams to do it. So UFOs have not been benevolent. And this isn't just some case with like, you know, some kind of like, you know, India, um, indigenous guys taking ayahuasca in the middle of the bush, right? This is like, this is investigated by the uh, the National Intelligence Service of Brazil. It was investigated by the Naval Intelligence Service, yeah. right? And yeah. it was investigated by Brazilian Air Force intelligence, and it was investigated by medical practitioners and psychiatrists. There's a website if you go, and it's got like all the reports. It was yeah, all yeah. massively documented. Documented. So people who say, "Oh, you know, they come in peace or they do this," yeah, yeah, you have to yeah. look at it on a case by case basis. No, ab absolutely. And uh, you know, I think you both you both know that I'm not necessarily someone that believes that it's all going to be positive and rainbows and kumbaya with these get with these things. But um, you know, I I do hold out that level of of potentiality, especially because I think that it's probably likely that we're dealing with a spectrum, and so there's other things out there that may not have our best interests in heart and perhaps other things that do and uh, the claris brazil case obviously yeah is a is a disturbing case and uh, you know i almost hope that i'm wrong in my assumptions that there is some substructure of government that understands what these things are because you know it would be 
it would make more sense for this step by step process that we're seeing now, uh, you know, to be happening if we didn't have any sort of previous knowledge. So I, I kind of hope that we we are ignorant because at least we're seeing if that's the case, a, a relatively sincere attempt to get this out into the public sector. And, you know, let's let, let's bring this back to the UAPTF report for a minute. Um, <laughs> what, what, uh, what, what aspects of this, and whoever wants to answer first, you go ahead. You know, what aspects of this do you think people need to focus on that you think are, are key? Because there's a lot of bureaucratic jargon, I have to admit, because I, I jumped on it quite early when it was coming out, and I, I read it for the first time recording my reaction, and I put it on YouTube, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a boring read. It feels like it's been structured in that way to almost send the normal person to sleep while they're reading it. So, you know, as, as guys who have got the Intel military jargon background, what aspects of this did you find to be the most worthy of highlighting? I want to add first off, it's not a report. Okay. It's preliminary not a report. report. Read, read, read the front cover. Preliminary. It's not a report. No, it's preliminary assessment. Yeah, assessment. And what okay. Avril Haines says is a real report is coming in 90 days. So we haven't had a report. We've had a, we. this is like a prologue. Yeah. Uh, this is like prologue to war and peace. A taste it's ten, 10 pages of prologue before Leo Tolstoy gives <laughs> us the entire French and Russian war right, period. Right, right. This is a, an, an apparatus. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I had a I had a kind of boom shakalaka moment, which I saw, and and, I, and nobody's picked up on this, right? Um, the depth sec dev, Kathleen Hicks, so she's talking. I direct the office, uh, blah blah, blah under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence Security, to develop a plan. Then it says the plan should include, and it goes point one, and it says and to establish recommendations for securing military tests and training ranges, right? And the the other thing is. The Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence is yeah. on SAPCO. They are on the SAP Coordinating Committee. Okay, so I'm asking, how are these vast areas of air, surface, and subsurface, right? How are they going to be secured? Because if we're talking like um, you know adversary platforms like you know a conventional aircraft, drones, they can be intercepted, uh, they can be downed. Um, if we're talking five observable UAP, right, and i.e. not Chinese or Russians, but something else, then how are we supposed to secure those areas? So they seem they're impervious to interception. So how to deal with it? And remember, in, in the, the the second paper, the first and second paper, I went into, uh, you know, the possibility of like shooting them down. And safati has got various ideas about it. But he basically says that, you know, that, that they're impervious. They've got this white hole, potentially a, a system whereby they, right. they they literally are immune to directed energy weapons, yeah. to projectile weapons. So how, how how so what I'm asking is, what are these recommendations for securing the military test and training ranges? Yeah, these yeah vast that, areas. That's, that's, that is a big deal. So, so <laughs> the other thing I want to point out to you is a, good point. a lot of people that you know kind of not involved, they miss stuff. So let me tell you some stuff, stuff they missed. So when uh, what's his name went out with the clear <clears throat> and took a video in 2004 uh, after Fravor and Dietz came back and got us this FLIR video where it was dark hot. Man, that tick hot was hotter than hell. It had a really hot uh, shell around it. Why does it need all that heat? especially since you can't see any exhaust or anything else supporting right. it. So the, 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 whatever the body was, it was hotter than blue blazes. It wow. was so hot, it saturated the sensor. So, I mean, you know, in, in terms of sim simplistic language, there would probably be a force field of some, some whatever. degree. Whatever. Well, but what I'm telling you is uh, if, if it's got something that hot, if it can generate enough heat sitting inside our atmosphere to black that the sensor out, when it's reading black hot, that means it's capable of generating a ton of power. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thermodynamically, it's coupled to our atmosphere, and it's really, really staying hot. That means it has to be replenishing uh, that heat from an energy source that's right. inside right. the Tic Tac because it would be bleeding off to the atmosphere if it weren't replenishing it. There are there are energy sources on that thing which are quote out of this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was alluded to, I think, in the in the SCU report or the other one There's by Kevin Knuth, where this they were saying that obvious. it was like with the power, the the power, it was like equivalent to something like a ten megaton blast every 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 second or something. That the wow. power and and, 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 and the, the the over the Teddy Roosevelt in 2014, hundreds of these things sitting at eighty to a hundred thousand yeah. feet 
for 24 hours a day, popping up and down at will. Do you have any notion how many joules of energy is that would consume by any kind of conventional aircraft? We, we could run all the navies of the world on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to add to that. Um, asking about the, there's a big section in my first paper on literally appropriately enough called shoot them down. But I asked Dr. Jack about it again and he goes, of course, I don't know the details of actual Tic Tacs. Okay. However, it's possible they're completely impervious to attack because of the effect portrayed here. Colonel John Alexander, and you'll like this, he goes, the main issue, in my humble opinion, is consciousness, not physics. <laughs> Downing <laughs> them, not a chance, has been tried unsuccessfully. Bigger question is why. Yeah, yeah. And Alexander, of all the people I know, would be one most likely to know. Yeah. So if we, right, we've got what we've got from the report. You both have obviously, you know, read it and digested it. And uh, now we're waiting on, uh, I don't know what day the countdown would be on now from when it was released. What, how, how many days have we got until the next one's supposed to come out? Well, let's just, let's just add a hundred, let's add, let's add, 120 days to when the first report came right, out. Right, right. So that you, you can figure out when that, the, uh, what, October or November? Yeah. October? October? Yeah. Uh, September or October, I think something else will come out. So I think, I think, I think, I can tell you what, I just think there's a massive argument going yeah. on inside the government about what to actually that out. Right. And the, the, the thing that's the thing that has me really thinking something might come out is Biden hidden stopping it. And he could stop it with one executive order. Do you think he's not stopping it um, because he wants to see it come out or it's just not on his priority list? He doesn't want it to interfere with his uh, agenda. Right. He doesn't want to interfere with his priorities, but he is not going to get in the way of it. And I think he, yeah. I think Podesta has talked him into just letting it go. Let, let your national security advisor handle this and manage it secretly. Right, right. Yeah. So what, go on, Frank. Go ahead, mate. No, I was just going to say, if you're, you know, we were talking about that, the wider context of it, mm -hmm. it it's almost kind of like snowballing because you've got to look, think about it. You've got like the all the events surrounding Lou Alexando, uh, the DOD FOIA process uh, being yes. obfuscated for files, uh, the DOD in in Inspector General's evaluation, right? All these things. There was just, um, I was going to say, there was a New York Post article that came out, right? Um and it was basically smearing him. And it oh says, "Oh my gosh, yeah, I yeah, saw it said connected crackpots and cranks have gotten a few politicians <laughs> to force the Pentagon to investigate the issue several times, and even to hire believers for some of the work. One nut, such nut or sink, Luis, Luis, Luis Elizondo claims that higher ups ignore and actively suppress evidence of alien encounters." This was um, written but, by so, the so editorial I, board. The editorial yeah, so board. Wait, 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 I, I want to tell you what. Look, 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 the New York Post and the Department of Defense IG. They are underestimating Danny Sheehan if they think they're oh going to get gosh. away with this. Right? I mean, right? it's just yeah. not going to happen. Well, you know, yeah. actually, let's let's break into that real quick. Like, with Danny Sheehan and, and Lou Elizondo, um, where do you think that's going? Because it seems to me like Lou's on the warpath. Well, that well, he's, he on, is. That, well he's, he's, he's unleashed Danny Sheehan. And uh, according to Danny, in multiple uh, panels and interviews, some of which I was on, others that I have listened to, the kind of gist of what he did when he went in there is they said, okay, look, let's, let's agree on paper here to kind of talk all of this out internally. And he went a big F you anything that's said in here, I'm going to walk out the front door and talk about it. So you better behave. And he <laughs> refused to sign any secrecy agreement. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, they, they, they now, re they now realize they're dealing with an adult and not yeah. somebody yeah. they can cow. Yeah. But he, he's had clearances threatened. He's been pressured in other ways. Uh, yep. the, um, his emails, uh, the constant contra controversy over his tenure. Oh, he, he, he never had anything to do with it. It wasn't part of his, um, of his brief, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, all, all, all the crap going on about the foyers and UFOs and, and that, that whole issue being managed. It just, if, if you wanted, if you wanted to detract, uh, away from some kind of like you know a uh, decades old cover up this would not be the way to do it you're just no. you're just sticking your you're no, shooting yourself no, in the no, foot no. continually right. this, this is like this is like uh keystone cops trying to keystone run a fire drill. Yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to run a fire drill so yeah. it is the real, uh, we we call it in britain we call it a cake and ass party oh yeah it's just <laughs> really well, do do you think that uh, do you think that they're kind of sitting back and realizing that they might maybe poked the wrong beast when it comes to Lou? Because I mean, he's looking to run for Congress now. Well, except, except except the response to 
all of that, because remember, all of that activity happened before the day the report was yes, released. Yes. And on the same date the report released, the Deputy Secretary of Defense says, cut out all this shit and behave and get on with this and get it done. And he yeah. assigned it to a person who is now responsible and that the Armed Services Committee and the Intelligence Committees both interact with and can call onto the carpet and put that person under oath. Yeah, I think also as well now, yeah, because now you've got like, you know, lawmakers and they basically, they're, they're intrigued by this and some of them have got the bit between the teeth, uh, so to speak. I don't think that they're going to let things go easily. No. And so when people hear, hear, hear Ole, Elizondo talking about, well, I might run for the Senate, it's like a big oh shit well, moment. The, yeah. the, 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 this is the first time I have heard people on both sides, Republican yeah. and Democrat, yeah. in one committee talk in a bipartisan way about an issue. Well, well, this is, you know, this is uh, the whole aspect of the classified report that we haven't been able to see that everyone's wondering what exactly what, you know, what was shown to these people, because if it's enough to catalyze that level of uh, bipartisan interest between two very, very uh, disagreeable factions of politics, then uh, it must be relatively convincing. And, um, you know, Bob, you, you made some comments recently that someone that you know uh, has had access to this. Uh, people people I know have had access to it, and right. they, they have not revealed one atom of content. But the following comment was made. Uh, you were doubted when you began studying this because we thought you had lost your mind, and now we know you didn't lose your mind. You are way ahead of us, and the content is like science fiction. Yeah, That was the gist. That's in a nutshell is what I was told, is that yeah. it's real. And it's like science fiction. I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a misquote, but I, uh, on Twitter it was something like forty minutes of science fiction was shown, or something when so, it came so, to the video. So the, for something like for, this person was guessing. Yeah. And you know maybe look for all I know they're not sitting there with a stopwatch, but they're seeing stuff which to them is shocking. And maybe it maybe it's in minutes, and to them it seemed like forty. Okay. So, but I'm telling you. I yeah, think yeah. there was a ton of things yeah. shown to these people who <laughs> went to all of these meetings that none of us have seen. And Lou Elizondo has gone on multiple interviews recently where he's talking about the evidence that has not been shown is really remarkable and high def. Yeah, but the, the evidence that will never be shown to the public. Well, that's he a question. Be, be, the, 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 fr Frank, Frank and I agree, but let me explain to you. When you show something, say, taken from an airplane of a craft, especially if you show some of the numbers around it, and it shows uh, all of the imperfections in the rivets that are holding the airplane together, even though it's 20 miles away, you've now revealed the capabilities of your systems to all of your adversaries. Right, they are right. never going to do that. Well, this it's is the, never this is the frustrating issue, isn't it? That it falls back on sources and methods, and and that's the uh, you know the national security stamp gets put onto it, and it has like Lou Elizondo said before. Usually, it has nothing to do with the fact that a UFO has been recorded. It's the fact yeah. that you were over Siberia with a satellite, or you were so, you know doing something. Well, I want you, you to understand doing. now why, uh, as a retired person from the intelligence community and working for. DOD intelligence community at, at a university doing research, I decided yes. to start something that the general public could do and hopefully not get the same kind of evidence they get, but get enough evidence they can't control so that we can start a groundswell of support for finding out what is actually going on by having John Q. Person, Joe Sixpack, Helen sitting on the end drinking a wine, people gathering this data and evidence and showing it to everybody, and it can't be can't be controverted in any way. Yeah. yeah. I get like yeah. one thing one thing that people um would probably say on the on the UFO community side of things is like, oh, but you know, can't they just black box the sensor rate readouts? Can't they just crop out the image so it's just that thing that we're seeing? No, but no if you if you showed the actual image itself and that the the, the that reveals things about the capabilities of the instrument mm. i'm just telling you it does yeah. yeah yeah and also potentially like you know the you know what's the normal you know trajectory of a particular satellite if it's showing like a particular you know right. a particular area right. that can be identified as well you know yeah. you can figure out well you know when when's it going to pass over and where 
All right. So in terms of the, uh, the, the, the next pending report, based on what you guys have seen from this, just as a just as, you know, a little bit of guesswork. What would you expect the continuation of this to be for the next, high, the next high, round? Highly classified with lots of data going to the com- committees and we'll never see any of it. <laughs> yeah, Mr. I, I Mr. agree. Optimistic. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, I, I listed as well, you know, why, why weren't aerospace and defense companies like, you know, my first right. paper, why weren't they included? I mean, and I said that... Uh, if there's been analysis of craft and occupants for decades and even interactions maybe with, en- with non-human entities and the civilization- civilizations they come from, then all the people who know about that, you know, the ones who are still alive, right, they need to be subpoenaed, right? People yeah. like Wilson, yeah, and I've come around to Wilson, which you'll be happy to know. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they need to be, didn't they need cho- to be you subpoenaed. Didn't have a choice. You didn't have a choice, Frank, because you're a logical intelligence officer. Yeah. You just yeah, literally yeah, yeah, didn't have yeah. a choice. Yeah, but I wasn't going to jump on the bandwagon until I had more. Oh, I got but, um, it. But, and had but, I had I had I I'm going to tell you the cra- the craziest synchronicity in all of this since I got into it was me having gone to a classified conference and have a friend call me up to his office and say, what the hell do you think about this? Wilson is asking me for help with this. And I told him, run as fast as you can. Forget you ever got that letter. And I forgot about it. But I did make an entry in my journal. Mm-hmm. And the entry in the journal said it has no classified information in it, but it's enough to jog my memory. And I went, can you believe all this Wilson stuff is crapping out? And I got to see something way back then that kind of says this actually happened. So but yeah. it's just kind of all is weird. But the, the, the other, just th- this, the people who want to be told the truth about Roswell, they just need to steal, f- steal themselves so they're not going to get it. Okay, yeah, so yeah. we might we might we might stand up some systems that now glue together information about UAPs, and maybe there will be general announcement from public relations officers that will now work for the UF office, UFO office in the intelligence community and the Pentagon. Or maybe yeah. maybe maybe that maybe that entity will be uh, at National Reconnaissance Office yeah. uh, with somebody from under the, de- the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence w- managing that office, and they will be advised and informed by the Aerospace Corporation, which is the keeper of all the keys to the kingdom and all the treasures in the aerospace industry. Uh, that's yeah, where I expect that's where I expect all the secrets in the United States to be. Yeah, I mean, I'd say yeah, that and, and you know, D- DOE uh, potentially yeah. based on uh, Eric Davis's well, that's, email. That's, that's, for, well, that's for, so look, whatever these things are, they have some kind of energy system yeah. allowing them to be propelled and move around and even be transmedium. So that energy system will be studied by hey, the Department of Energy inside <laughs> yeah. of its national Big surprise, labs. Right? Big yeah. <laughs> but I, I think I mean I agree. Any anybody subpoenaed, right? You know, whether it's you know Wilson, anybody who's alive and who knows yeah. about it, that's gonna be in camera. That's not gonna be in an open hearing because no, they don't want no. them talking about, oh yes, actually we do have a yeah, craft and we're maybe about 10, 10 years away from actually getting it flying, you know? So, so. The, 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 the 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 most startling things I have heard recently that came from somebody who I never thought would say them is, oh yeah, I tr- I beat on a door with a sledgehammer trying to get into Lockheed Martin so I could see the down craft and they told me no from the former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid in a video yeah, interview. Yeah, he did say that, didn't he? Yes, he did. And that was astounding. <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, I'm still uh, I'm still reeling a little bit from uh, Ross Coltart's little revelation about uh, the former director of the U.S. Navy Science and Technology Division, Nat Kobitz, because that was a that was a pretty you know astounding admission from a very senior member of the uh, of the kind of infrastructure of the U.S. Navy, saying quite clearly, and obviously, unfortunately, the man has passed away, so it's it's one of those where oh, we're not I wish able it was to. On uh, video. Which, Only uh, wish it was on but... video. I know, I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me about yeah. it. Yep. I don't, I don't want to be doom and gloom, guys. Um, but doom and gloom is my thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, P- I know a lot of people don't like, like, you know, the threat narrative, but there's, I believe, it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? I mean, if you look at Project Condine, which came out two thousand, uh, two thousand, it was released publicly, yeah. I think, two thousand six. 
So you had Defence Intelligence 55, which is the part of the Defence right, Intelligence right. staff in the Ministry of Defence, which is looking specifically at UFOs, right? So they they quote uh, Marshal Sokolov, who was uh, a Soviet uh, Minister of Defence between 84 and, and 87. And he was a really, really well-regarded, like, you know, Marshal of the Soviet Union. Otherwise, he wouldn't get to be a Marshal. So they're talking about, you know, pilot and air crew losses, yeah? And then, you know, there's been a, a documentary as well, which actually John... Uh, pointed out to me, um, you know, Soviet admirals, Soviet era admirals and, and submarine captains talking about not just Russian submarine losses to USOs, but also American submarine losses. Right? right. I personally believe this is the tip of the iceberg. Now, whether it's whether those Russian aircraft uh, were, you know, effectively uh, were affected by, you know, a, a field surrounding the UAP or whether the UAP used some kind of a deliberate directed energy weapon against them. I don't know. I wasn't there and we may never know, but it's something that's going to be, uh, I think very much on well, the minds of, uh, of anybody involved in this. Uh, one, 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 uh, kind of anecdote from, well, we've had it from, uh, commander David Fravor and we've also now had it from Lou Elizondo in a recent interview was the event. I'm not going to be able to remember the specific location or I don't even think he said the time, but the event where there was a USO that actually sucked a missile underneath the, the you know, the, the surface of the water when they were doing weapons tests, they were doing telemetry tests, I think with the missiles kind yeah. of shooting them, and uh, a black mass came up from the bottom of the ocean and essentially just sucked this uh you know missile underneath the water so there's definitely something going on in that regard i haven't actually heard of any cases with submarines being uh being taken down into the depths so that's interesting so I yeah mean, look, I there, there, there there have been there have been uh, uh reasons posted for the loss of the uss thresher and there have been reasons posted for the loss of the right. soviet submarines but how do we know any of that stuff's true? Can you flip? Yeah. Can you go down there and look? No. I mean, all we know is what we've been told. And maybe some of them have weird things happen to them that yeah. we just cannot explain. Well, I don't want to go conspiracy theory, but remember when the Kursk went down, right? You yeah. know, the Brits and the, the Brits and the Norwegians, right? They had teams ready to go and to be there like in less than 24 hours. And the Russians kept them off as long as possible. Yeah. Until basically the blokes were dead down there. Yeah, they, the they, Russians they, they could have made, had help to save yep, their blokes, but yep. so they kept the Brits and the Norwegians out until they were dead. They kept them knowingly until they were dead. Wow. <laughs> why would you do that? Why, why in the world would you do that? I mean, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm being, you know, was it to cover I'm, up? I'm, you know, I'm yeah. Afraid. Yeah, this what, was it to cover a... up Russian incompetence or was it to cover up it, something yeah, some that they really problems. didn't want the rest of the world to know? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. I mean, you know, like, 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 you know, our esteemed colleague has just said, we can't go down to depth and check it out for ourselves. We don't yeah. know if it was like yeah. the torpedo propellant that mixed in the wrong way and and set off an explosion. We don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, well, what, I, what gar I guarantee you this: uh, the United States has 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 submersibles, and yeah. they've been down to the curse and looked. Oh yeah. Mm. Hey, there's, there's just no. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just telling you, you're you're nuts if you think we haven't gone down and looked. And at the minimum, you can easily send a drone that has no humans on it yeah. and go look at every inch of the curse to see what happened. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure well, the Yanks would have been all over that. All <laughs> Maybe over the pesky it. Brits as well. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Remember, I, we did the Glomar Explorer before we even knew what we were doing. I wonder what the actual water connection is and whether or not we have compelling footage of, of USOs as well as UFOs. I mean, you know, obviously, as civilians, there isn't uh, many opportunities to put high definition cameras or optics or sensors in the water. So anything like that would probably be under the purview of military. I, it, may, it makes me think about... Uh, you know, scientific exploratory vessels and things like that, like actual kind of, uh, you know, civilian efforts and whether or not some strange things have been seen. But there isn't there isn't much evidence, even though it's very clearly happening because of what's been said and stated. It's just interesting. There isn't much, uh, you know, uh, evidence for for unidentified submerged objects, at least not to the same level as as UFOs. But it would seem they're probably the same thing based on the no, 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 if, 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 if I were going to if I were going to set up a base on Earth. Yeah, and I had all sorts of transmedium capabilities. Yeah, I would go where 75% of the things that are intelligent can't go. And that's deep and underwater. 
do you think it's just a posting then? Like, you, do, you not, do you not think that maybe, because uh, I mean, like from, from an evolutionary point of view, I'm struggling with it, but do you think there's any possibility that that's actually their origin from, like they, they're from the oceans? I, I have absolutely no idea, but that is as good <laughs> as any. Because, I mean, look, the, 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 the issue, okay, so the, here's what I, how, how my thinking goes as a person that thinks about, you know, kind of the physics and the mechanical yeah. engineering and yeah. electrical engineering and so forth about how you would go from one place to the other. Okay. So a being that lives in the water, uh, and if it's not a really, really crazy place, yeah. they don't have access to fire. Exactly. And so you know, how are you going to do metallurgy? Well, how are you going to have rocket engines, et cetera, for you to do the first time you go off your planet? So I just think almost surely anything that ever came here walked on land and breathed a, a breathe uh, breathe a, a gaseous state system before they went yeah. underwater for the first time. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here because they wouldn't have machines of the type that are going to going to be needed. Now oh, that's yeah. just that's just me thinking as a earthbound physicist, yeah. Yeah. mathematician, engineer, etc. No, I think you're right. I mean, it's obviously the more plausible thing is that it's a it's a it's an element, it's an area of the earth that we struggle to visit. So it would be the best place to set up a base of operations, so to speak. Well, to, but, but uh, look, to we, kind of... we 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 haven't funded it, will, but we have had deep submersible bases yeah. where people have lived underwater yeah, yeah, long yeah, periods yeah. of time. I mean, we've had them. We, we we continue to operate them, and I think we're going to continue to operate them. And we are utterly ignorant about our the seventy five percent of the Earth. We're just yeah, ignorant. Paul, Paul Stonehouse has got some really interesting stuff on YouTube um, because obviously he's got the Russian language skills, and he's you know all over like you know uh, about the you know the, the former Soviet admirals and and sea captains and he really uh, is the, putting out interesting stuff like yeah 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 and lots of stuff about you know kind of like you know from the seventies you know deep 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 submersible craft you know going to the Mariana Trench and the deepest stretches of the oceans right, right. the Aleutian Islands the Kamchatka Peninsula um you know about and basically you know UA, UAP and, and USO activity um it's very very interesting and it seems you know they're like the Russians. You know, former Sovs, Russians, uh, they, they, they've been a lot more forthcoming than, uh, than the Americans. Not, have. That, not I mean, only that, but apparently a lot more aggressive than we have about poking them and trying to figure out what's going on with them. And they lost a lot of people trying to shoot them down and capture them. Yeah. I, I mean, I can only imagine from that visit that I did to the uh, that base in, 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 um, in the Canaries, I can only imagine that they've got, you know, just incredible, um, it can get incredible data from the water and from the different depths. And, you know, with the, with these boys, these, these, they've got Noah boys, they showed, they showed us that are like, you know, a thousand feet and more, uh, and move, you know, and, and the, and then these drones that move around, then you've got all the SOSUS, uh, sensors, you've got all the sensors aboard the submarines. That, 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 that and, and, that and we're, we've just announced in the last two weeks that we're going to replace the SOSUS sensors with modern systems. I mean, the 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 Sosa, the Sosa system set up to understand when the Soviets were leaving Murmansk and going down Red Route One on their way to the the U.S. coastlines. That stuff has been around like forever, but apparently yeah, yeah. we're about to update all that again. Well, are they still going to have it along the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap? Well, I did, but, some... look, none none of what I know is classified, so uh -huh. I don't know where they're going to do any of that. I'm just telling you what we know from unclassified sources has been there, and then. Clancy uh, figured out everything when he wrote his books about uh, you know, about about the things that are the Soviets were doing and that we were interested in capturing. I think the Kursk had a new propulsion system on it, or yeah. kind of like what Clancy was talking about, and they don't want us seeing it. So that's why they wanted us away from it. I think that's just one reason why they might not replace them along the Greenland, the Greenland Iceland UK gap is because. They had a lot of SOSUS there originally because the Russian boats had much shorter range missiles, so they had to kind of get closer to the American coast. But now, you know, the, basically the, the Russians could sit somewhere on the, in the Norwegian Sea or even just off their bases in Murmansk, right? And fire hypersonic missiles. 
hypersonic yeah, exactly, and yeah. stay in the atmosphere. That's, uh, that, that's, that's something that's uh, a curious thought to bring to bring it back to the uh, co- the conversation of UFOs is can they can they mitigate hypersonic nuclear warheads, tactical hypersonic strikes? You know, I mean, obviously they have the ability to shut down ICBM stations and and uh, neutralize nuclear payloads, but okay, so just, hypersonic's if, if, a different if, story. If you believe if you believe in the 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 liberal Western democracies and share intelligence sharing. They have known, or uh, if they have to have known what was under development a long time ago, and have mm-hmm. been working very very hard yeah. to figure out how to mitigate it. Yeah, yeah. and and just I could just just let me tell you, there is a very very common characteristics of the systems which are put out by centralized command dictatorships they make the same set of mistakes over and over and we will exploit those mistakes and they will have known about it forever so uh uh i just i I, hypersonics are to be a frightened of but they're but i guarantee you we've already preparing to deal with them i i don't know what they're about i don't you know i just who know who we don't know what their intent is we know they have a they are a potential threat but threat is 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 uh, scored by capability plus intent. We we have really good idea of their incredible capabilities, yeah. but we have zero idea unless they're unless we know a secret of what their intent is. Well, I, I, I wanna, sorry, go ahead, Frank. I was going to say when when we're saying they, right? There's lots of different types of craft. And there's lots of different types of documents that have been reported. So. You know, I'm not suggesting they're all like extraterrestrial, but I mean, you know. No, I, I th- me, me. What do I think? Why does if, it just if, have to if be this just is, one if kind? This is recon- if this is reconnaissance, I would send cybernetic organisms or or yeah. robot organisms, Some and they're all of artificial different. intelligence, so that because they wouldn't have to feed them across yeah, like interstellar distances. Yeah, like we do to Mars. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. don't have to feed them. They don't have to prepare air for them. They don't have to preserve them. All they have to do is protect them from uh, uh, radiation in the depths of space. And annoying well, humans. You know, yes. perhaps uh, perhaps any any bodies recovered are not not essentially biological. It could be, uh, you know, complex. As I said, cybernetic. Like that. Cybernetic. Yeah, cybernetics and, and things like that. Speaking about the threat, though, you know, I mean, so this is something that really confuses me. Maybe, Frank, you can help me out with this since we're both British and uh, at least one of us has had dealings with the MOD. But... Um, the Americans have have literally said it's a potential threat. Like that's that's underlined, scored in in official government documentation now with the preliminary assessment. Did you did you recently see that the UAP issue was brought up in the House of Lords and uh, Minister of State for Defen- Defense Annabelle Goldie? She, she um, was she was brilliant. She was brilliant in fending off <laughs> all challenges. And she, and what like, did she say? She Nothing. said, "I've got I've got the quote." No, no, no. She, no, no. She what said, she said What she said is. What she basically said, let me paraphrase, this is no damn threat, so we're not bothering, but she you said, can keep yeah, asking, yeah. and I'm going to answer it by the same said, defend, we are, uh, we, are aware, we are aware of the U.S. assessment, but the uh, the MOD has no plans to conduct its own report into UAP because in over 50 years, no such reporting has indicated the existence of any military threat to the United Kingdom. So, I mean, how can you make that kind of statement now? Is that possible? How can you make that statement? Yeah, but they, they do actually... Um... They do actually, uh, there's a 1997 um, report that came out pre-Condine, and I can quote from that, yeah, um, which actually goes into a bit deeper. Uh, Nick Pope and his wife very kindly sent it to me. It's in the UK National Archives, but it hasn't been digitized yet, so it's not commonly right. available. Right. But it says, this, this is, by, again, from you know, Defense Intelligence staff at the MOD. So it says, the second critical question is, do UAPs represent a possible threat to the defense of the realm, right? And this is 1997. Right. We could debate that, assuming for the sake of argument that something exists, that they have never shown any hostile intent and therefore cannot represent a threat. However, Russian aircraft attempting to penetrate the UK air defense region in the Cold War never showed hostile intent, but they certainly <laughs> represented a threat. Thus... The only logical conclusion that we can come to is that we do not know if UAPs rep- represent a threat to the defense of the realm. We cannot eliminate the possibility. Okay? Because we don't know their intent. Yeah, exactly. We know their capabilities. We don't know their intent. Yeah. So, and then it goes on. It says um, on the next page, it goes, uh, it goes, lack of evidence of hostile acts does not mean that there is no threat. I believe that we'd be failing in our duty to the nation. Uh, if we continue to ignore UAP reports, 
The question now is, what do we do? And the question still is now, what do we do? Like, what, when, when, when on earth is the British government, Ministry of Defence, any sort of aspect of uh, of the British infrastructure going to get involved with this? It seems like, I, you know, it makes me quite suspicious. Of, is, is, of what isn't they she know. bound? And when she's on the floor of the Parliament, isn't yes. she bound by the Official Secrets Act? Well, sure. she is if it's classified. Yeah. If she's yeah. received yeah. a classified yeah. briefing, yeah. so so she's not going to sit there and tell you classified information oh, on the floor of the House. No, of course she's not. But I'm just I'm just very tired of this like bureaucratic linguistics game that's going on where it's just like, oh, what, just what else sit. do you what else do you expect? That, that to do? <laughs> at least, she's, at least she's, some, uh... she, she, she is not about to come down to the floor of the house and say, yeah, I was over at MI6 today and and, <laughs> and went to GCHQ last week and they told me all this crap oh, and you I'm, would love I'm, it. They're I'm not, not expecting that. I'm oh. not expecting that. But the very fact, <laughs> the very fact that the U.S. government has acknowledged that there is at least some level of potential threat. Uh, at least to the airmen who are having, you know, near collisions. It just makes it's like it's like the British government is living in a separate universe where they're refusing to interact with the reality that's coming in. And it's just I don't know how they can ma- maintain that going forward. The, the universe that the, the the Brits are operating in is to wait and see which way the wind blows and how yeah. it goes with the U.S. Yeah. And they will follow the U.S. lead every every step of the way. I mean, if, look, look back to Rendlesham, right? If you if you look at, um, you know, what Nick Pope has written about it. Um, you had an American general who's the head of U.S. Air Forces Europe comes over to the U.K. and basically takes over the investigation. Right. Right. The Brits are going to follow the American lead. Okay, so that's number one. And look, I'm just I'm very, very sorry to anyone in your audience who I offend. But (laughs) what what am I going to what? What? Look, you live in a country that has just said we don't care how many variants of covid are ravaging this country and how much it's going to damage us and we're never going to be able to defeat it, we are giving up. I mean, that when you've got that level of stupidity running your government and you keep electing them, you got a problem of people facing reality. And so yeah, if they yeah. won't deal with, a, with an earth-born disease, which we know is mutating and so forth and so on, and just think, hey, we give up. What are they going about to do about UAPs? They can't even figure out how they work. Oh, I don't. I don't think it figures into <laughs> Boris Johnson's day whatsoever. The idea of UAPs. But, um, <laughs> no, no, I know, agree with you there. But, but, but <laughs> you know, elements of the MOD, yes, and 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 you know, I just it, it was very brave well, that, of that. They're not, they're not going to tell you what they're thinking or doing. No, but you know, like the, it was like I, I just get frustrated with it because obviously, like the U.S. government is going down this path. Totally, totally get it. I'm yeah. Just, uh, I, 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 I believe that if anything we have about knowledge of energy sources and other things that could change the way the earth works, make it, make it a sustainable, renewable system that doesn't pour trash into the atmosphere and the oceans, mm. we ought to have known about it. And they better yeah. not ever let me personally find out about it or I'm really going to be upset about it. And I vote. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, it would seem if that stuff exists, it's probably considered some sort of ace in the hole technology. And, you know, we've got to <sighs> keep it as secret as possible. The human race will benefit f- more from us keeping this away from the Russians and the Chinese than they would if they were, you know, using it. So uh, it's, uh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I could I could see the argument now. We The Russians and the Chinese compared to us technologically, they're infantile. And everything they've got, they stole from us anyway. So we're going to sit back and we're going to keep all this secret and we're going to develop it until we own it. And then we're going to use it to 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 force our our will on everyone. I can see that kind of thinking, not that it's ever been said in front of me or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But that would be the kind of arguments that would go on that would want to keep everything secret from them. It's because right. we have energy systems which are working, even though they're poisoning us. I yeah. think uh, if you want to hear my theory on it, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you know, my question is always, well, if the Americans have always got like, you know, a deployable, you know, a, an active squadron, effectively deployable platforms, UAP, anti-grav, why haven't they been used already? Because potentially now America has never faced an adversary uh, like China, right? China, the threat that the former Soviet Union um uh, you know, presented to America is far less than China now presents because China's yeah. got the money, right? And it's aggressive, okay? And as Bob said, they've got a lot of very capable people and they also steal a lot, right? Both from the Russians and, and from the Americans. From everyone. But, 
Yeah, from everyone. But my view is, you know, Lou talks a lot about, you know, his security clearance and he's never going to divulge stuff. And, you know, in my second paper, it was talking about, you know, development of UAP technology. My theory is that he is basically, he and Mellon are upset at the way these programs have been kept so secret and isolated from each other. They want to show, ensure American military uh, and, uh, you know, effectively technological hegemony for, you know, the rest of the rest of recorded time. So they want to bring all these activities together, but not in the open. This isn't for UAP transparency. Yeah, yeah. This is so that they have more unified programs to progress America forward because the Chinese have already said that by 2049, they want to be the preeminent military, technological and economic power in the world. And who wants to live in a world with a country that puts its own people in concentration camps running the, yeah, running the show? Yeah. Nobody. Well, not me. So no. that's their plan, I believe. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, Lou is threatening to, to run for Senate e even better than then he'd have, you know, he'd have even more control over it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm quite happy living in a, in a world that's controlled by the Americans. I do not want to live in a world in 2049 that's controlled by communist China. Yes. No. Poor, I, Lou, I, poor Lou has a problem, though, unless he runs as an independent. The minute he says which party he's in, half the country will hate him because we are that <laughs> divided. Yeah, no, that's we true. We literally are. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's my take on it. And, you know, people who think that, he, he, you know, that it's going to be all about transparency. Stuff. No, 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 no. It's like no. any of these programs. I talked to my paper. You know, you remember you asked him the questions and he was talking about, you know, all the be benefits that you'd have from doing like a Manhattan style project. Yeah, that's not going to be in the open. That's going to be seen. No, it's, it's an arms race. It's an arms race. It's a, an energy race. I don't know whether I don't know whether it would be at Los Alamos, but it'll be in some place <clears throat> like it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's that's the end goal. It's, uh, you know, it's American hegemony um, and, uh, you know, stopping the. The red Chinese getting there by 2049. Oh, where is this going to go in our lifetime, gentlemen? It really makes me wonder where is this all going to end up going? I'm hoping the Americans do crack this tech. And yeah. as far as I'm concerned, the sooner the better, because then China's not going to have any more aspirations about invading Taiwan. So, so, the Ru uh, the uh, Russians uh, will uh, stay uh, inside their borders and, and, yeah. and basically you'll have a Pax Americana. Yeah, so, so the literally you have a ru one commodity economy in the Soviet Union, and they are undergoing the, the most onerous demographic inversion you can possibly imagine. And the Russians have dominated all the minorities that are inside their country. But whoops, that demographic inversion is going to make the Tatars the majority in a, in a country where they've been stomped on for hundreds of years. And yeah. I'm just going to tell you, the Russians are in trouble. And part of their trouble is they can't find enough 18 years olds to go into the armed services because uh, the, 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 the birth rate is not sufficient to, uh, to give a bunch of people to go into a military service. I think this is part of the reason they're trying to rebuild the Soviet empire. I'm not sure of that, but I yeah. just feel it. So that's number one. Number two, China gets almost all of its grain and other things from a region inside of China where that region is being clobbered by climate change. And they, they get a lot of protein from the oceans, and these oceans are being fish dry. So China, China has all sorts of problems, which if they don't act soon, they're going to kind of lose, in my, my, ability, my, my opinion, the capability to act in ways that we are fearing. And uh, I just think the Soviet and the Chinese, they better act quick or they're not going to they're not going to be able. And they're scared to death of what we actually have hidden underneath the table to use against them, yeah. which is smart yeah. on our part. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very temperamental world. We've come up to about an hour and a half, guys. So we might as well look at wrapping this up now. Is there anything that you uh, either of you well, want look, to look, add? Jay, we, we rambled on for hours. What what questions do you have for yeah. either one of us? <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we just rambled for an hour and a half. No, I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite happy. I mean, the, the, what I wanted to have was like a general discussion of, of the things that we, uh, we see as important and emerging in the ufo topic we've gone off into different areas you guys are both military guys so you've 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 you know gone off on on a few little tangents about tehran and other things but well, I, I, other, I, think, you know, look, I think i think i think the message i would like to leave your audience is i'm not a person that wants to run out and go to war frank is not no. a person that wants to run out and go to war war is the last resort if anybody that wants to go out to war as the first resort is an idiot 
because it does nothing but destroys everything. You want war as the last resort. But what you want is for those in charge of defense of your national uh, integrity and security to be prepared for all sorts of eventualities. Yeah. And uh, just just look, since the end of World War II, when the United States brought kind of all the major powers of the world together in the Bretton Woods in New England, and every single yeah. one of them were scared to death that what we were going to do was come and get them all in the middle of a circle and surround them with guns and say, okay, we now own the world because we saved all your butts, and now you've got to do things like I said. We didn't do that at all. What we did was we're going to open our borders, give you free access to our economy. We're going to put the world's largest Navy on all the oceans, and we're going to keep every sea lane open, and God help anybody that tries to do piracy, and we're going to help you rebuild the countries that are destroyed from this war. And so we've lived in the world that the United States made starting at the end of the World War II with of all the people that attended Bretton Woods. And that doesn't mean we're going to want to run the world forever, but what we want to do is see justice and equality and other things increase. And, but but we, are, we are aware, we are definitely aware that bad people are in charge in Tehran. Bad actors are in charge in Moscow. Bad people that want to blow away everything that's outside of Japan in and own it are in are in Beijing. And we know that whatever we do, we have to be prepared for all sorts of eventualities. We are not warmongers. We are people that understand you deal with threats by being strong. Yeah. And also think about this. I mean, think about, you know, Taiwan's only a country of what, like 24, 25 million people. They have outsized contributions to the world economy. And what have you got there? You've got like, you know, critical sem semiconductor, uh, right. you know, building capacity that runs across all the supply chains of the world. So um, well, you cannot I allow really, I those really semiconductors hope Biden to does, be taken out of circulation I really hope by the Chinese. Biden does what he says. He's going to move all, a lot of that back on shore and away from all those places because it's under threat and our economies will collapse without Taiwanese semiconductors. Yeah. We don't have right. any choices. We, yeah. we have some, yeah. we have things we have to do. I agree. Well, look, um, I think we might as well wrap it here because we, we have covered pretty much everything that I wanted to go over, which was just, uh, you know, current events, UAPTF, Lou Elizondo and Sheehan. Um, and, uh, and there's been some interesting anecdotes and, and ideas put forward here. So, yeah, uh, thank you, both of you, obviously. I hope, we, did, I hope we didn't bore your audience and no, th they're, they're, no. they're not upset with us. Cause, I no, mean, I, don't, I don't think we, so. We are, we, are, we, are wanting, we are wanting disclosure as much as anyone, but we're realists. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Have to be. You have to be. <laughs> I, you know, like, well, no, you're, you're right. You have to be. And, and I'm, I'm consistently struggling with my desire to be a realist with, and, and comparing that with, for example, like my own experiences with this phenomenon and, and how I feel about it on a personal subjective level. And, you know, you have to try and balance it because we need that balanced argument. And, you know, we, we, too often we, we, especially within the UFO community, fall into uh, bias or idealistic, uh, you know, viewpoints on, on what this might be. I'm open to pretty much anything being the possibility. And uh, I have to try and, uh, you know, make sure that I'm keeping my options open and, and not allowing myself to fall into a, a kind of like a hypothetical model. But I, I do think that there's a lot to be gained from this conversation that can bring positivity. There's obviously a lot we need to know from a national security perspective, from a, a technological perspective. But I think that there's a philosophical conversation here as well. And I think that there's something uh, to be taken from that. And I'm excited. Uh, the, the, the trajectory of the conversation is relatively slow, but um, I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to keep going for a few years and see where this develops. And I'm excited. I, to see I, where it I, I'm hoping that there are more people come along that are like me and Frank who yes, been, been inside sure and come, come outside and we'll talk. So look, basically I gave up my national security career after spending four days with Chris Bledsoe and having a bunch of experiences. Right. right. Okay. It's, it's just the facts are once you've, once you've experienced what's actually going on, it's hard. It's hard to say, I'm going to doubt what I saw with my yeah, own two eyes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There are, right. there's more of us that I hope will come out because it's clear 
that the impediment against coming out and talking about it in uh, legislative circles and others like it is, is falling. That is hopeful. We're not going to see the bodies from Roswell, but we might see a lot more people who come out and talk about what they've seen and what data they collected so that the Congress and others can take their stories and go find out where that data is hidden and bring it out. Can I uh, just just before we go, just add one thing? Um, of course you can. Yeah, SCU said that they were going to basically produce a report on uh, a kind of like a reaction to an assessment of the uh, you know preliminary assessment of the uh, ODNI uh, UAP report. So I've been on that team, and um, I literally, which you know, today and yesterday, been working on that. And I'm also going to be—I don't know when that's going to be coming out. That'll be up to the U um, the SCU board, but I will be blogging about it in the meantime. Um, so I'll let people know when that comes out via Twitter.